guys. I, I, I felt like it was just weird to have an introduction, so I just thought I'd sparkle fingers my way onto the stage. Hi, thank you guys so much for coming. I know it's Sunday and you're probably tired and you got a hundred other things to do, so thank you so much for being here. Um, was anybody at the Rick and Morty panel last night? Oh, okay. Actually, that's great because sometimes I happen to repeat my stories and then I'm like, oh, sorry to all the people that heard this last night. So what I usually like to do for my Q&A panels is I can kind of tell you a quick story of how I got started in voiceover. And then I'd like to open it up to you guys for questions. Um, and if there aren't any questions, then we just leave early and go eat lunch or something. Anyway, uh, so my name is Kari Walgren. It is Kari, like Ferrari. And um, I'm from a really tiny town in the middle of Kansas. And um, people always ask me, well, how did you get started in voiceovers? And the, the answer is that I loved cartoons. Uh, I was obsessed with cartoons when I was a kid. And apparently when I was five years old, I told my parents, I'm going to be the voice of a Disney princess one day. And they're like, okay, all right. But it was weird because I had this sense that there were people doing the voices behind those cartoons. And I would, you know, run around the house acting things out and ha ah, 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 you know. Um, so I definitely loved Disney when I was a kid. And then when I got a little bit older, I loved Batman the Animated Series. That was a huge influence on me. Um, and when I was, I think I was maybe eighth or ninth grade and I was watching that show and Andrea Romano was the legendary director of that show. And I actually looked up Warner Brothers and I wrote a letter to Warner Brothers to her. And I said, I love your casting and your voice direction and someday I'm gonna move to Los Angeles and become a voice actor. And I really hope we get to work together. Uh, so fast forward a hundred years, <laughs> and when I walked in for my first session on Ben 10, playing Charmcaster, Andrea Romano was the director. And so that was one of those wonderful moments of just, you know, feeling like, wow, something that I dreamed of for a really long time has happened. Um, so, so anyway, I went to, to college, and then I uh, did some professional work around Kansas City. Um, and then I moved out to LA. And back then, they had uh, papers for, like newspapers for actors, and they would list all the things that were casting. And they had this ad, the first year or so that I lived in Los Angeles, they had this ad saying that they were looking for voices um, for an animated project. So I went and I auditioned, and they said, hey, we like your audition, we want you to come back for a second one, and we're gonna send you home with a VHS tape. For those of you that are too young to know what that is, it's something we had a hundred years ago to watch movies. And you stick them into something called a VCR, and then you watch it, and pictures come up, and it's in color. Uh, and um, so they said, you're not going to understand what it is, but just see if you can kind of capture the sound and the tone of the character. And so. You know, I had no idea what was going on. There was this girl coming on and in on a Vespa, and she's like, Master! You know, I'm like, I don't know, but okay. I went into the second audition and tried to capture her energy and everything, and I got cast, and it was Haruko in FLCL. And that was my very first uh, anime. Um, and then I started doing more anime, and then I started getting booked on video games, and um, then I started getting booked on American cartoons. My first one as a series regular was Super Robot Monkey Team Hyperforce Go. And the fun story about that is that the first recording session that I went in for that show, there was a guy in the crew wearing an FLCL t-shirt. And I said, I don't know if you know this, but I, I did the voice of Haruko and he flipped out. So it's so weird that you never know how things are gonna come full circle. So, so that's kind of how I got started. And they have not kicked me out of Los Angeles yet. I keep doing cartoon voices there. And um, yeah, so that's kind of how I got my start. And man, so now you guys can IMDB or Google or something, but I, I've gotten to, uh, I've been lucky enough to, 
to do over like 550 cartoons and video games and stuff like that. So it's always hard for you guys that have come to the signing. I never know what to bring <laughs> because uh, people will come up and they'll be like, oh my gosh, uh, I loved you and such and such. And then I won't have the picture there. So, uh, so that's my story in a nutshell. Um, I can continue to talk about myself, or, but I'd love to hear what you guys have to say. So does anybody have any questions out there? I see there was one hand there. Uh, and I guess, are we gonna, do you wanna just kind of walk around with the microphone? Yeah, let's do it. Give you guys a chance to talk in the mic. Hi, I, I had two questions. They're both about Rick and Morty. Uh, the first one is, what was your favorite episode working on the series? And then the second was, was there any, given the content of the show, was there any scenes that you kind of felt uncomfortable doing or blatantly just refused to do? <laughs> <laughs> um, man, it's hard to pick a favorite episode. It, does it have to be one that I'm in or just in general? No, just in general. Um, I do love the Keep Summer Safe episode as far as one that I'm in. And how that one started, you guys, is that I had two lines as Rick's spaceship in an early episode. And so we were in the recording process and I just started messing around and I was like, turn left, you idiot. I did not say turn right, learn how to drive. And they're like, wouldn't it be fun if we wrote an episode where the ship gets really snarky? And so they wrote the Keep Summer Safe episode. So that's actually what prompted Sorry. That's actually what prompted the second question was because like the baby melting and the dead guy's kid dissolving <laughs> into that. I was like, that's kind of, all right. <laughs> I, I feel like as far as anything that was just so gross or so out there that I refused to do it, usually Rick and Morty have all the super gross stuff. So I've, I've, I've been okay. I, <laughs> I don't want to jinx it, but uh, yeah, they, they haven't had me do anything yet that was too awful. Solar opposites, on the other hand. That's, a, that's another story. I've had some, some really rough lines on that one. Yay! Thank you so much. <laughs> right, who is it's so sweet, you guys. Everybody's trying to be polite. I feel like I saw this gentleman's hand up next. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering if you could do the Excalibur thing, like when she pulls out Excalibur and does the yell. Oh, can you, one more time, a little louder? I was wondering if you could do the Excalibur th uh, line, like where she pulls oh. out the sword. Are you worthy to be my master? Excalibur! <laughs> it gives me Thank goosebumps you. every time, you guys. I have a life-size Excalibur in my office, and I, I get little goosebumps. Yay. So fun. Hey, how's it going? It's going well. So earlier you said, you know, just how wide your repertoire is in the industry. You've worked in anime, you've worked in video games, you've worked on American cartoons. Can you give us an idea of maybe if there was any kind of dichotomy be working between the different types of studios, whether it be, you know, working with the producers or just the studios in general versus like the anime studio, the video game studio, and the American studio, or the people that you worked with? Well, uh, the first big difference is how we record things for different kinds of projects. Um, and you guys may already know this, but you know, if you're recording an anime as a voice actor, they've already created all the visuals. So you, you, have, you have to sync every single line up to a picture that's already there. So if they, you know, if this is the person's mouth and they're like, and they just do three little flaps like that, you can't say, I love you, I've always loved you, and I'll love you until the, I take my last dying breath. You just have to say, I love you, because that's all you got in the animation. Um, the good thing is that you have all the music, you get to see the facial expressions. Um, you know, the original Japanese, I take so many cues from that because the emotion of those performances really influence what you're doing. I think you need to respect the original Japanese performance when you're doing it in English. Um, so, so there are pros and cons to it. Um, when we do an American show like Kung Fu Panda Legends of Awesomeness or something like that, we record the lines first and then they animate to us. So if I 
I want to take a big pause. They're going to animate the character, so if I want to take a big pause, you know, they'll animate it to what I do with my vocal performance. Um, so, and then with video games, depending on if it's something like Final Fantasy uh, versus something that they're creating in the States, you know, we may have to work according to timing and stuff like that. So the way we record it at all these different places is very different. Um, as far as the studios and the people, I mean, sometimes when you're working on a new show for Disney or Warner Brothers or something like that, there are a lot of people that have to weigh in on your performance. So the first few uh, sessions, you may have a room full of people, tons of writers, a director, engineer, clients, producers, people from the network. Oh, you can't say that. That you, you know. Oh, you've got to change that. So there are a lot of people that you're trying to. I don't want to say please, but there are a lot of people that are weighing in on what you're doing. Um, whereas with anime, usually once you get the role, it's just you and the engineer and the director, and you figure figure it out between the three of you. So. Yeah, so it's, it's different for each thing. Uh, Follow-up question to that, the second part, I guess. Um, was recording at the Rick and Morty studio and working with those people, is it as chaotic as the show appears to be? <laughs> um, actually, the team itself is very chill, and uh, especially there's this awesome gal named Sydney that uh, would kind of run the show, the overall show, and she just ran like an awesome tight ship. Um, but that's good because then the actors and, you know, Justin and stuff like that, they can go all crazy and, and just, you know, flex their creative muscles. Thank you. Yeah. Next, I saw you. Okay, so two questions. First of all, do you have to learn a different language for any of your roles? And what's your favorite role? It can be video games or anything. And why? Okay, so one more time. It was just a little hard to hear you. Oh. Um, did you have to learn a different language for any of, of your roles? And what was your favorite role and why? And video oh, game okay. That's a great question. Um, uh, I had to learn some Farsi for Prince of Persia when I played Elika in that game. And then uh, I had to do some... Uh, German for Helsing. I had to sing um, sing an operatic song in German. Um, so, so yeah, those were probably two kind of challenging parts. And usually they, they break it down so that we can sound out everything um, or they'll have like a dialect or language um, consultant on the set. And the one other thing I can say is that I've done one project. Did any of you guys see Christmas Chronicles? on uh, Netflix, it's a Christmas movie with elves, at least one person. They actually, the guy that wrote the foreign languages for Game of Thrones wrote an elvish language. And so we, Debbie Derryberry and I both played elves in those two movies and we actually had to learn elvish. And the guy that wrote it was there on set so he's like, no, it's Flugzeuge. It's not flurg, it's flug. So, like, that's how particular they got about our, our elvish accents. And her other question was, what was your favorite all-time character? One of her favorites, is that what you said? One of your favorites. What was your favorite all-time? Oh, what was my favorite of all-time? Oh, that's, that's always the hardest question to answer. Um, whatever I'm just working on, Next, like, I mean, I have like a list of sort of sentimental favorites, but I can never pick just one. It's too hard. It's like picking between your children. Great cosplay. I'm sorry, not doing recording. Questions? Oh. All right. Hello. Um, I have a question for Selty, if you don't mind. Of course. Though there is a story setting this up. So, at a uh, small Pennsylvania uh, convention called PsychoCon, which is now defunct, in 2016, Shizuo asked Selty Sterlison for her hand in marriage. 
and he got shot down. <laughs> and later on that weekend, Shinra asked and was accepted. However, later on at the autograph table, sorry, <laughs> there's a message here that says, Shizu-chan, we'll get married next time. Oh, that's Selfie. hilarious. <laughs> and so, six years later, on bended knee. Oh my goodness. Selfie Sterlison, will you make me the happiest bartender in, he in Ikebukuro and marry me? Oh my gosh, this is so awkward, but I already said yes to Shinra. But I will take the ring. So if you want to bring that ring up, I will never ever turn down something shiny. <laughs> bring it, bring it, bring it, bring it, bring it. First of all, two things. Congratulations on the not engagement, and it's nice to meet you from afar. <laughs> <laughs> this is actually, I got really nervous because you guys, it looks, it looks really pretty. See how sparkly it is? I feel so loved. Thank you. So my question for you is, is there any especially funny stories from recording in the booth that's worth telling us today? Oh. Yes, but okay. Some of the funnier ones, I, we have to be of a certain age to hear. So I can't say some of those stories today. So I'm trying to think of one that I can tell you. Um, okay, I can think of one. So my, when I get hungry, my stomach rumbles. It just grumbles really badly and I can't hide it. So, you know, it's gotten so bad during some of the, the sessions that uh, they've said, okay, we've got to stop and you've got to get something to, to, just a few bites of something to eat because we can't get a clean take. And it is funny because um, sometimes my stomach knows that I'm a voice actor, so it'll, it'll just gurgle in between lines. So I'll do a line and then it'll be like, uh, and then blah, 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 oh, you know, so it'll do that. But I was recording, uh, Oh my gosh, maybe Gadgard or something? It was something many, many years ago. And I was, I was playing this young girl and she was fighting this huge monster that was taking over the city. So it's just like, whoa. <laughs> and I was like, I'm so sorry, you guys. My stomach keeps making these noises. Well, the engineer recorded my stomach noises and synced them up with the monster in one scene so that they played it back and I'm like, I will defeat you! And it was my stomach as the monster. Did they pay you for those monster noises? <laughs> they did not, sadly. They were like, I'm sorry, we're going to need a bigger monster noise. But, uh, but yeah, it was pretty funny. So Thank you very much. Hi there. Um, Hello. Quick question in regarding um, someone who wants to become a voice actor. Would you recommend sending demo reels to agents or to particular like producers or? That's, you know what, that's a great question. Um, so for anyone that is, you know, wanting to pursue voice acting, there's, there's only about so far that you can get without an agent. So it depends on what you're wanting to submit for. Um, I know that some places, like I, I think Funimation in Texas used to do open call auditions. So sometimes you could, uh, from what I've heard, I, I'm, I'm not in Texas, so I don't know for sure. But from what I've heard, you could send demos there. You could go to the open call auditions sometimes. Um, I think there are maybe one or two anime companies in LA that do the same thing. Um, but if you, if you wanna start doing things like bigger commercials or Disney shows or things like that, pretty much 99.99% .99 of that goes through agents, unless they're looking for something super specific, you know, like a, 
a 10-year-old Nairobi a child or something like that, you know, where they might kind of do some sort of open casting call, the rest of it's all going to go through um, agents. So if you're at a certain point where you want to start, if you feel like you're ready, then start submitting it to agencies. Uh, because that's going to get you so much further along and, um, and give you the opportunities. But the other thing I will say is make sure that you're ready. You know, um, uh, this is something that I've said a hundred times. A bad demo is worse than no demo at all. So just really make sure that you put a good demo together uh, before you start sending it out. Because I know I had a not great demo. I thought it was a good demo, but when I first moved out to Los Angeles, I did not have a good demo. And I got just passed over by all these agencies. And I finally just said to a friend of mine, can you please just ask your agent for feedback on why this was passed over? And I got some really helpful feedback. And so I put another demo together and then I got a good agent. So I hope that helps. Thank you. All right, so what, uh, my question for you is like, uh, with FLCL being a bit odd, to say the least, <laughs> uh, what like scene, uh, do you have a scene where like it took you a bit to grapple with what was going on or um, what to, like just how to read the lines correctly? Yes, the entire show, my friend. <laughs> um, I am so glad that that was my first show in some ways because I, uh, my first anime show, because I just had no expectations. And so I was just kind of ready to roll with whatever was happening. And so, I mean, as I was recording it, I had no idea half the time what was going on. Like the whole manga scene, was like really trippy for me. And I remember Haruko having the long monologue where she's like, you know, rage against the machine, Richard Cheese, you know, and like saying this long list of uh, musicians and bands and things like that um, uh, was also like kind of frenetic. So yeah, there was just so much of it that I, that I didn't get but that's one of the great things about you know acting is that you just kind of show up and you're like okay I'm just ready for anything um, let's let's go crazy and it I guess came through in the performance. Hey, I'm a really big Rick and Morty fan, and I have two questions. Okay. Are you and Morty ever going to get together? <laughs> Gosh, you know, he's such a nice guy, and I, I just feel like in some world we get together, but our timing is terrible. And now that I'm a time god, wow, I might have a lot more going on, so I, I'm not sure. I think he's really going to have to step it up now that I'm a time god. <laughs> okay, and my second question is, are you like currently working on Rick and Morty season six or can you like not answer? We, that? I am under so many NDAs and ninjas will come out of the wall and shoot me with, with uh, poison darts. Uh, so I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Kari. Hi. So, Tiger and Bunny season two comes out next month. <laughs> Do, is there any information you can tell us about it being English dub? Uh, all I can tell you is that uh, Blue Rose is coming back. <laughs> and um, I love her so much. And um, that's about all I can say. Okay, that's okay. <laughs> Again, poison darts, something. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, what was your favorite TV show you were working on? Oh my gosh, that is my favorite TV show. Oh, that's a hard one because there's so many that I like. Um, man, and there's some new ones right now and I can't talk about those quite yet. Let's see. 
One of my favorites recently, um, DC Superhero Girls was really fun. That's like a good cast. And right before the, everything got shut down, sometimes we get to record all together. So for DC Superhero Girls, it was one of those shows where we actually got to all be in the same room together and record our parts. So that was super fun. It was really fun. Uh, hi, you had mentioned um, Andrea Romano uh, a little earlier, and she is one of the, the amazing legendary voice directors. Do you have any specific uh, anecdotes about working with her when you had the opportunity to do that? Man, you know, she just, um, she's, she is retired now, um, and to this day, she is the best director, hands down, that I've ever worked with. Uh, she just had this way of commanding a room, and, uh, and she would just make, she was just so efficient with the time, and uh, you know, she was just one of those people that was very groundbreaking about uh, thinking outside the box with casting. You know, she started casting, uh, well, I mean, Mark Hamill as the Joker, and you know, all sorts of other people that just kind of changed the, the landscape of what voice acting is. Um, so I can't really think of, of any like specific story. It's just more that she just, everything would just move so smoothly with her. And if she gave you a note, it was super specific and you would just make the change and you would just move on. So working with her always just felt like flowing with, in wa with water. Hello. Hi. Uh, so I have this friend that's very into Rick and Morty, but he wasn't able to come here. Is it all right if I request that you say something in the Jessica voice for him? And what's his name? His name is Dylan. What, what was I could hear? Uh, Dylan. Billy? Dylan. Dylan. Yeah. Could you say, Dylan, candy corn is good and you know it? Any corn, wait, any corn candy is corn. good? Candy corn. Candy corn is good? Okay. And you know it. Dylan. Candy corn is good, and you know it. <sighs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, my favorite show that you did was Winx, and I wanted to know you, like, your thoughts on when you went through it and any favorite line or scene. Well, the show Winx, I got to play Ferragonda. And Ferragonda was basically the Dumbledore of the fairy school. And I loved playing her. Because here are all these little beautiful girls flitting around with their fairy wings. And I got to be the old headmistress. And it was just a lot of fun. So I just remember really enjoying that part, you know, just savoring every line and just feeling like I was guiding these young girls on their magical journeys. <laughs> uh, I just thought of another question. Was there any show, like, when you were recording, you were kind of like, yeah, this show's never going to take off that, like, blew up, like, out of the world that you just kind of didn't expect? Well, definitely Rick and Morty. I mean, that one it, right there is the perfect example of that. And, you know, um, it's, it's so strange to just do, uh, you know, one of the earliest episodes and, um, and you're just thinking, man, okay, this is cool, this is fun. And then it goes out into the world and then suddenly, you know, a year or so later, you're at Comic-Con with this huge, <laughs> room full of people and there's like a Rick mobile outside and like it's it's crazy it's um, so yeah that's the biggest one I can think of another question I have is is it ever hard to like switch voices like back to a normal voice if you're voicing something if you like a voice like this hard to go back to like your normal tone of voice that's a that's a good question um, it, it every once in a while it gets a little tricky if you're talking to yourself so, you know, if you're doing this character, it's like, oh, mom, I want to go to the park. No, honey, you can't go to the park. Well, but I have to remember that I'm saying this, and, you know, I, I just, I don't like the park. The dogs are scary, and they're big, you know. So <laughs> trying to switch back and forth sometimes is, like, you can get a little bit confused. Um, but I also find that so fun. So 
Yeah, as long as they, the only tricky thing is we can do multiple sessions a day. And so if the engineers don't save us a sound sample, I cannot remember what I did. So if you, if I did a session and the next day I came back and they said, okay, so let's just do what you did yesterday. No clue. Cause I've done, you know, 20 other things since then. So I'm like, I can't remember. What's been the most challenging voice that you have uh, voice acted for? Definitely Melina in Mortal Kombat 11. Uh, she was just very like textured in this kind of voice. And the first session that we did for her, they, they booked me for four hours and about two and a half hours into the session, I started to lose my voice. And uh, they're like, okay, you know, we're gonna, we'll do a few more lines and then we're just gonna stop early. And after that, we would only book two hours, which was great. Especially with video games, we do all of our own battle efforts. So if you're playing the game and you hear this, uh, uh, ah! like we record pages and pages of that stuff. So it is really hard on your voice. So, um, yeah, with, with certain games and, and with, with companies that are like really sensitive to their voice actors, they will make those sessions shorter so that you don't just completely kill your voice. The Last of Us Part Two was that way as well. Because I, I did a bunch of the militia, number of the militia people, and we had the most blood curling death reactions for that game. And so they would only schedule it for like, one or two hours. Hello there. Hello. Hello. <laughs> um, my original question was um, revolving around FLCL because there's something like a little poetic about it being our first anime in a sense, like it being your first anime role. And me, it was like my first anime coming from a kid who watched reruns of Speed Racer, and that's about it. So I wanted to ask, what's the deepest um, work of animation that you've worked on that maybe you didn't grasp onto the themes as quickly as a lot of people did, but you still maybe thought to yourself, you know, I just have to be a part of this, or like, I'd, I'd be honored to. Man, um, <clears throat> well, I don't know if this exactly answers your question, but I will say that, um, FLCL is the one that continues to mean the most to me on a certain level because uh, for one thing, there are so many themes in it that I continue to think about more and more all these years later. And things that didn't make sense six years ago suddenly make sense to me in a new way as I get older. Um, so that's been kind of a, a profound experience to just kind of think on those things and, and as time passes to keep having the themes pop up for me. And also, you know, to have that be my first anime role and then to be here, sitting here with you guys 21 years later, I think, um, uh, and have you still asking about it and saying that it meant something to you, like there, uh, to be part of somebody's life in that way is something that I could never have imagined and that I take very, like it means a lot to me when you guys come up to the signings and you say that something, you know, meant something to you at a point in your life. Uh, it's, it's, just so, it's just so profound. I can't even really express what that's like. Um, and you know, when, when we were doing it, I, I was just hoping I wasn't gonna get fired <laughs> in the first two or three sessions. Um, so yeah, I think that there are certain, certain titles, especially with that one, that as more time goes by, it just becomes more meaningful to you, to me, and uh, just continues to mean more and more, and the themes start to mean more and more as you get older, so. Yeah. That was beautiful, thank you. I'm sorry if this question is too similar, but uh, what was the saddest moment you had to act out in anime? 
What was the saddest moment to act out? Oh, saddest moment in anime? Um, man, okay, definitely the, the very end of Witch Hunter Robin was one of my all-time saddest moments. I was, I was definitely crying in the booth. Um, and I can't say that it was the saddest, but as far as like the most emotionally grueling, it was uh, uh, Rip's last scene in Helsing. I mean, that one was emotionally rough. Like we, we finished that scene and I went outside and just kind of was like, okay. So. So um, another question I had was with um, The Last of Us Part Two being received the way it did, did you ever did you feel any of the backlash that was put towards the game or your fellow voice actors? Um, and just so I heard correctly, did I feel any backlash from the... You know, uh, not really. And, um, y you know, depending on... No matter what anyone's feelings on it is, uh, it was so well done, and the performances were amazing. And, you know, Laura Bailey went on to win a BAFTA for her performance and, you know, uh, Ashley was nominated. And so, um, you know, I know that maybe some of the story choices were not popular, but it was beautifully done. And, um, and it was very risky uh, storytelling. And that's amazing. Like I, I applaud that whole team for everything that they accomplished with it, so. I just wanted to know, like, when you're trying to decide what roles to uh, apply for or, you know, pick a role for something that you've been chosen to attend, how do you go about picking what roles to take and which ones to pass? Like, is there a certain connection you have to feel to the show or character? Like, what, what makes you decide to do something? You know, that's, that's an interesting question. So we... Honestly, even at this stage of the game, we audition for most everything. So, um, you know, there are certain things, knock on wood, I'm, I'm lucky enough that sometimes I get cast without having to audition, but it's for like a, a side part or woman number two and, you know, something uh, non-offensive or, you know, nothing that I have to ethically weigh <laughs> at night, you know. Do you have bread in stock? I don't have to really think about, wow, gosh, how do I feel about taking that role? Um, uh, however, I, I have gotten to a place in my life and my career where I will pass on auditions that I don't feel comfortable with. Um, and, you know, sometimes I'm just not in the mood for certain character stereotypes. And so if, if I'm reading the script and I'm like, uh, you know, I'm just not feeling this, I'll just pass on it. Um, so. And there have been a couple of things that I've turned down, um, but it's been cool because it's, it's all been handled respectfully and privately behind the scenes and stuff. And, uh, but yeah, most of the time it just happens in the audition process that I can just pass on auditions that I don't want to do. Just to follow up on that, what made you, like, when you heard the pitch for Rick and Morty, what was your thought process? It's like, oh yeah, I'm gonna, I have to do that show. <laughs> Oh, well, Jess and I had, had done fish hooks together. Uh, and so the, the second that it w I heard that, oh, this is Justin's project, I was very excited to audition for it. I mean, I could have been a, you know, here's your, your dinner, sir. Like, and I would have still done it for Justin. Oh, my goodness. Going way back there. Sorry, hi, um, I'm a huge Samurai Champloo fan, and I was just wondering, in reference to your earlier anecdote about your stomach noises, if, um, you know, because a big theme in Samurai Champloo is that they're so hungry all the time, if they ever used your stomach noises in Samurai Champloo. <laughs> um, there are no stomach noises in Samurai Champloo that I know of, 
But I, I can say that that was one of my favorite things about Fu's character is that she ate a lot and she was not ashamed to eat a lot. I, I'm like, you go girl, you eat as much as you want. And I still, to this day, when I've had like a really big meal, I'll do the little ho, 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 ho that she would do in the show when she would <laughs> eat too much. Like, so I still think of Fu whenever I have my food belly. So this is actually a follow-up question to the previous question. Um, what's, what are some of the parts that got away? The ones that you wanted, but you didn't get? Oh, you know, I can't actually verbalize which parts th those are because I, I, I don't know, it's, 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 like I just wanna honor the people that got those parts. Um, but I can say that there have been a couple that I just like really wanted. There, there was one in particular that I did multiple auditions for and it was between me and one other person and the other person got it, but they, they did a great job. So, you know, uh, I, I can only respect that, that they got the role. Um, I can say that there are certain franchises that I just have not gotten to work on that have been super sad because I loved He-Man when I was a kid and I had my, I still have my Tila action figure. And uh, so the fact that I didn't get anything in the He-Man reboot crushes my soul just a tiny bit. And I would have been happy to be a villager just being like, ah, you know. Uh, so that one. So every once in a while there's just like a franchise where you're just like, ah, that hasn't worked out. But, it, but here's hoping, there's hope springs eternal. Hi, I just wanted to say, I remember when you did the online Zenkai Con Q&A, and you mentioned that you would love to play Scarlet in G.I. Joe, and some of us children of the 80s are still hoping you get to play. Oh, Great thank you so much. Oh my gosh, that is still, man, that, I would do that in a heartbeat. Yeah. My question is, earlier you said that when you dub an anime, you like to go back and look at the, the Japanese uh, role. When you get a director that wants you to do it raw without looking at the Japanese, does that become a, a difficulty for you where it becomes a struggle to then get the voice that they want or are looking for? Okay, and just so I heard correctly, so if the director wants me to do it differently from the original Japanese voice actor? Like go in without having heard the Japanese voice actor first. Is that a, a, a problem for you or an extra challenge when you do the, the role? Okay, and, I'm, and I hope I heard this correctly. Um, so, uh, most of the time, it's, okay, there's two, two ways I'm, I'm, I'm thinking with my business brain and my, my artist brain, which is actually the, the answer to your question right there. Um, there have been a couple of times where I have agreed with a change. For example, um, there have been like one or two Japanese video games and series where they will have a character that is a, uh, an army squadron leader in her mid-30s who sounds like this. And uh, just from a pitch standpoint. And the director has said to the client, an American audience will not buy that this woman is in her mid-30s and leading a whole battalion of soldiers. And so we will change the voice and make her a little bit more like this, you know, patrol, go out, gather reinforcements and we'll go back into battle. So we'll change the voice there. And in, in those couple of situations, I've really agreed with it. Um, there have been other times where uh, I have felt artistically that there was like a little bit more complexity that we could have gotten out of character, but they, they wanted it so close to the original Japanese sound that at the end of the day, I have to ask myself, okay, my job, what is my job? And my job is to, to make the client happy, those people that have hired me. So if, you know, I'll pick my battles, on certain lines, but it, at the end of the day, if they want the character to sound like that and to be 
uh, you know, a lot closer to the Japanese, even though I may want to do it a little bit differently, I need to give them what they hired me to do. So I hope that answered the question. I'll come back to you after her. Hi, as a continuation from my other question about Wings, what was your favorite line or scene that you played as Farragonda? Oh my gosh. It's hard to think of a favorite line. Um, yeah, I don't think I have a favorite line, but I, I think just those, those scenes with Farragonda and Bloom in Farragonda's office, where she's just kind of, you know, encouraging her to, to do the right thing and use her powers for, for good and to just kind of keep learning and growing. I, I found those scenes really charming and fun to do, so. Hi, so kind of coming off of that question, I was sort of wondering if there's like a different sort of mindset you have to get into in order to voice like a character, say like Headmistress Farragonda versus like Z from DC Superhero Girls, and I really have to ask you to say like literally anything in that voice, because I'm kind of obsessed with her. She's like my favorite from that show, which is like my guilty pleasure. So wait, wait, so uh, I couldn't hear the last part, so y you are obsessed with Z? Yeah, from DC Superhero Girls. Oh my gosh, you have amazing taste. What's your name? Jillian. Jillian? Is that right? Yeah. We should totally be besties. Listen, you love Z because Z's fabulous. She's like so overdramatic. And I love all of her scenes like with Green Arrow and stuff like that because he's so stupid. <laughs> but yeah, I just, Zatanna is just so much fun because she's just so dramatic about everything. And I was in, um, uh, I was in school plays and acting when I was in high school, so I just totally relate to Z and how everything is super drama. So much fun. Thank you so much. <laughs> Hi, this one will be more quicker. Um, uh, for Samurai Champloo, what was your favorite episode to either perform or just story-wise it really stuck out to you? Man, that's a hard one to answer. Like, when I think about my favorite things about that show, the things that I think about are the music. I just loved the soundtrack throughout the show. Um, I loved the artwork, and I loved Jean. I was just team Jean all the way. Like, the long hair and the professor little glasses and stuff like that, I'm like, ha. Ah. So, total cutie, uh, yeah. Th those are my favorite things. I can't really think of an episode, but th those are the things I loved. Uh, is there anything in the works with Slaughter that oh we have to gosh. look forward to? You are fantastic. Do you have a t-shirt yet? I may give you a free t-shirt for asking that question. Uh, uh, so Slaughter is my tribute band. It's my all-girl tribute band to Slaughter, which is a hair band from the late 80s, early 90s. And hopefully, 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 we are going to get to start doing some uh, shows live again at the end of this year or early, early next year. So our hope is, we were trying to do this right before the shutdown, is we're hoping that we can start trying to come to some conventions and perform. So if that's something you're at all interested in, let the band, you know, let the people know. And, um, and it's pretty great because Mary Elizabeth McGlynn, who did Cowboy Bebop and Critical Role and everything, she's in it. Sarah Cravens, who was in Injustice 2 and Mortal Kombat 11, she's in it. So it's a lot of fun and we would love to come and perform for you guys. We have just under 10 minutes. How are we doing? We doing okay? Just under 10. Okay. Uh, I guess this kind of pertains to my last question. How did you take the uh, ending of Heaven's Feel in uh, Fate? Oh, man. I mean, that was... <sighs> it's just so good. It's just so epic and just... Uh... Yeah. I, I, I mean, I don't even know what else to say other than just... Uh... <laughs> it's just... It's just like rips your heart out and... Um... That whole, that whole series and then the movies and everything are so cinematic and just, I, I think Saber is just such an amazing layered character. And uh, so I just, I feel like there's just a lot of layers and depth to that. 
speaking of your tribute band, can you give us an idea of how that sort of came together and happened? Oh my gosh, yeah. So, you know, I, I back in 2016, I went to this, um, it was like a, an all day hair band festival. So all these different bands were playing, there were like 20 bands and Slaughter was one of them and I just fell in love with their music. And I had heard a couple of songs when I was younger, but uh, you know, I just kind of fell in love with it. And, and I went and saw them in concert again. And on the way home, I remember saying, oh my gosh, I just want to get up and I want to sing Slaughter songs. And I, I would have all girls and we would call it Slaughter. And I was like, huh. And from there, we just kind of created this, uh, this band and, um, and it's just so fun because like, I, I like wearing my Slaughter t-shirts to conventions because we're all wearing things that we geek out on and things that we love. And that's one of the things that I really love. So I like being able to wear that and share that with you guys as far as, hey, this is music I really like and stuff. Ah! All right, we'll talk. All right, we think we got time for uh, a couple more questions if anyone has them. Hands up, anybody? Got time for like one more. Anybody have, oh, we got one in the back. Make it a good one. Oh, I see ah! you. I'm coming. So when you were doing the voice acting for Rick and Morty season five, did you have to do it at home? Or? Uh, so all of the Rick and Morty recording uh, since, yeah, 2020 has all been from from home and it was the craziest thing because I can't remember I think maybe it was season four or something and uh, the first episode uh, came on TV and I was just like I recorded that in my basement and it was just like the weirdest because it was the first time I'd seen something that I had just recorded and I was probably in my pajamas <laughs> so I'm just like walking down into the basement with my cup of coffee and recording Rick and Morty and um, so so yeah in, in fact everything the last two years uh, has been from my house, from my home studio. All right, okay. I think that might be it. You guys, thank you so much. This is my first convention back in two years and I have loved it. Thank you. And now I'm heading to the airport. So bye you guys, thank you so much. This is Mick Wingert, and you're watching Fandom Spotlight. Be sure to like and subscribe, and don't forget to have fun and follow your fandom.